There's a rare moment in cinema that happens when a franchise film breaks the mold, leaping out from the confines of what came before it and emerging as a remarkable, even revolutionary film. A film that honors what came before, but is not beholden to it, instead forging a new path and building something of its own. 15 years ago, coming out of a four-year hiatus, the James Bond franchise needed to accomplish this. After the insane outlandishness of Die Another Day, something that was fundamentally broken in the franchise's formula, something needed to change or else the 21st Bond film would have probably been the last. The Bond film we got in 2006 needed to find that rare moment and didn't because Casino Royale did so, so much more than that. It's impossible to forget the reaction Daniel Craig got when he was unveiled as the new Bond in 2005. The ridiculous sound bites. He's blonde, he's shorter, he looks like a henchman. The shitty websites, the endless thrashing in the tabloids. It was pure nonsense. It had a debilitating effect on the crew while they were making the movie. Artists who stood by Craig through all of it, but who also felt like their work was being dismissed before even being given a chance. But everyone pressed on, and when Casino Royale premiered in London on November 14th, 2006, the people who dismissed Bond offhand were eating crow. Daniel Craig wasn't just a great Bond, and Casino Royale wasn't just a great Bond film. Both were arguably the greatest of them all. This is a film that gave us Bond's origin on the screen for the first time ever, sent the character on an emotional journey that allowed him to discover who he is and what matters most to him. Him and left him, as the end credits rolled, largely established as the secret agent we had come to know in the previous 20 films. And if that's all Casino Royale had managed to do, then you know what? Mission accomplished in spades. Hell, at the time, it would be understandable if a lot of people's initial reactions were that Casino Royale did exactly what it had to do and nothing more. But now we're 15 years removed from that London premiere. We've been able to revisit this film countless times, return to the feeling it gave us, and experience new feelings feelings we didn't know were there the first time. Because sometimes, that rare moment is achieved and then exceeded. Casino Royale did just that. It doesn't betray or dishonor what made the past film so great, but it does reach far above what Eon had ever tried to do before. Simply crowning Casino Royale the best Bond film and then calling it a day is almost a disservice to it. It's so much more than a Bond film. It's a cinematic landmark, one of the most brilliant, moving, exceptional films ever made. And I know, I know it's easy for me to say that when I'm a massive Bond fan. I get it, but it wasn't always that way. Before I saw Casino Royale, I had enjoyed Sean Connery's Bond films, Pierce Brosnan's Bond films. I liked James Bond, but I wasn't any kind of huge fan. I know, it's hard to believe that I wasn't born this way, but if I can drop another bombshell, I didn't even see Casino Royale in the theater. I rented the DVD from Netflix back when Netflix was a goddamn mail delivery service, and it fucked transformed me. There were three films that solidified my love of cinema. Peter Jackson's King Kong, Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, and Martin Campbell's Casino Royale. And I'd even say Casino Royale was the most important of the three. As soon as Daniel Craig spoke the immortal line and the film smashed to black, I was a Bond fan for life. The name's Bond. James Bond. But even if I hadn't become a massive Bond fan, hell, even if Casino Royale was made in a vacuum and there were no Bond movies before or after it, I'd be saying the exact same thing. So sit back at the poker table, grab a Vesper Martini, and don't let our little game cause you to perspire. Let me show you the inner workings of this remarkable film and why it's probably more so than any other film I've ever talked about on this channel, a masterpiece completely independent of my supposed biases as a Bond fanatic. To understand what Casino Royale is, we have to look at who Casino Royale is. James Bond himself. The film operates as a character study and deconstruction of Bond, creating an intrinsic, unbreakable synergy between character and story, more so than any other film in the series. 
So if the impact of this story rests solely on how fully formed and sympathetic its main character is, and the character's resonance relies on the impact of the story, you can't just carry over someone we've seen before and expect the audience to go on a journey. You have to rebuild him from the ground up. But how do we get there? Well, the obvious answer is, hey, Griffin, this guy named Ian Fleming wrote these books in the 50s, then they made some films in the 60s, and just didn't stop making them, yada, yada, yada. 2006, and here we are. And that's not wrong so much as it is an imperfect oversimplification. Fleming did craft this character based largely on an exaggerated version of himself, and Casino Royale was the very first story Fleming told about Bond, but that original novel wasn't so much a blueprint as it was a foundation, something which Fleming built upon and modified in subsequent novels, and which would later be reinterpreted in a different way by each of the first five actors to play Bond on the big screen. By the time you get to Pierce Brosnan's portrayal, the charming, handsome, smooth agent with a dark side, you end up with at least half a dozen ways to picture Bond. This is to say nothing of how Fleming's writing changed over time, or how certain actors may have modified their portrayal part way through their tenure as Bond. The end result is a character with 50 years of history on the page and screen, yet with no unified statement as to the finer details of him. The only things set in stone about Bond pre-2006 are that he's a British man who drinks, loves women, and kills people for a living slash for his government. Now that's not to say he was never allowed to be a three-dimensional character, it's just that his extra dimensions shifted through the decades, and sometimes even book to book or film to film. By starting with a clean slate in 2006's Casino Royale, by rebooting the series to Bond's very beginnings, the character is automatically unburdened by the kind of reverence or history that would have otherwise followed him into the film and made it impossible to properly deconstruct him. If Bond had begun the film, film with a series of established and immovable traits, then an audience would just accept that that's who we're going to spend the next two hours and 20 minutes with, and so we would lose the entire point of rebooting him at all. Why go to all the trouble of showing us Bond's beginnings if he's already where we'd previously known him to be? Why create an origin story if it doesn't show the origins of anything, if it doesn't force Bond to earn the things that make him iconic? Casino Royale's primary objective is to do that with Bond. When we meet Bond in the film, he doesn't have an Aston Martin, he doesn't have his mannerisms or catchphrases, he doesn't even have his double O status in License to Kill. It's about as far back to the second as they could have possibly taken Bond, short of giving us a movie about his childhood and military service. That isn't to say Casino Royale doesn't reward us along the way. We don't have to wait very long for Bond to at least earn his stripes, thanks to the masterful black and white opening. We first meet a James Bond who is assured and calculated, breaking into the office of an MI6 mole in Prague, finding the evidence he needs, and then calmly waiting for the traitor's arrival. Right from Daniel Craig's first line, we're looking at a man who thinks he's untouchable, one who will do his duty but do it his way and not stop to ask for permission or question his own judgment, because in his own eyes, he can do no wrong. Bond's not going to react when the mole points a gun at him because Bond's already taken the bullets out. He doesn't take pleasure in killing Dryden. That split second shot of Dryden knocking over a photo of his family isn't there by mistake but he does calmly get it over with, believing and accepting that it simply must be done. That isn't unique to this Bond film, most of Bond's kills in the series are done dispassionately, but Casino Royale actually explores this part of his personality rather than just having him kill someone and assume you'll accept it as an audience member. The first seed for the exploration is planted when the film flashes back to Bond murdering Dryden's contact in a brutal fight, and then sprouts roots when Bond shoots Dryden. Yes, considerably, he remarks, giving Dryden a posthumous response to whether or not killing is easier the more you do it. Contrast how Bond is breathing heavily and trembling after he drowns Dryden's contact to his composure after shooting Dryden. In just three minutes, we learn a boatload of information about a character we had already spent 20 films with. If the slate hadn't been wiped clean, if they had made Casino Royale with, say, Pierce Brosnan without rebooting the franchise, even if they had otherwise written and shot that cold open the exact same way, none of those nuances would exist. 
It would just be another day in the field for James Bond and for us. This is the issue behind Brosnan's tenure in general. And look, I love the guy. I really, really love Pierce Brosnan's portrayal as James Bond, but there's no central planned out performance guiding his four films. He's bringing back personality traits established by Connery and more, creating a nebulous and unfocused version of Bond. It causes Bond to drift into being a fantasy, and as a consequence, you lose the character and instead start to get Bond films that just check boxes. What we get instead with Daniel Craig is the beginning of a story, the first piece of the most fully formed arc Bond has ever gotten on the big screen. And you know what? It doesn't hurt that Eon picked one of the most talented performers alive to physically embody this progression. Craig spent more than 15 years prior to Casino Royale making his name playing three-dimensional and complicated figures in a diverse, charismatic, and always interesting set of projects. No matter what role Craig is playing, he finds their layers of humanity with an attention to detail and thoughtfulness that shines through via the performance. And with his bond, Craig is maybe even doing career best work. He nails the mannerisms and the lines, but he's also constantly digging into who this person is and builds upon his discoveries in each scene. As a result, Bond spends the film gradually becoming the man audiences associated with the past. He never jarringly shoots a mile forward. It's a steady progression from who he is in the pre-title sequence to who he is when he finally says his catchphrase for the first time. This approach is one that Craig has consistently applied to all of his Bond films, always building upon what he's done before, while also making each edition feel new. As a result, his entire tenure in the role has felt so unified, because there's always a focus on the details, on what Bond is doing and why he is doing it. More so than any narrative throughline which Craig's tenure certainly has, there's an emotional throughline that doesn't have any impact unless you lay the groundwork here. This is a masterful performance. Some critics during the 2006 award season argued that Craig was even Oscar worthy, and they were absolutely right. If you don't believe me, go watch the fight in the stairwell and then the scene afterwards where Craig cleans his wounds, confronting who the hell he is. When you apply that type of acting to writing that wants to examine the character's headspace, as the screenplay for Casino Royale does on nearly every page in which Bond appears, the end result is going to make you think long after the credits roll. It's the opposite of coming in flippantly with reverence towards the character and a wink towards the audience, which would have just come off in a cheesy way and fallen flat on its face, and worse, would have created a one-dimensional portrait of Bond, an unexciting and unmemorable foundation rather than the fully realized human character this movie needed to have. But Daniel Craig, for all of his infinite talent, is only one piece of the puzzle. He can give the performance of his career all he wants, but if the rest of the team didn't put the same confidence in him as he had placed in himself, it would be almost impossible for that performance to come through. Thankfully, Eon Productions more or less hired Craig because of his work ethic and approach to crafting a detailed, fully alive character, and director Martin Campbell had both the humility and trust to go along with his lead actor, support his performance choices, and then shape the film around what they created through their collaboration. Collaboration. Everyone involved knew that they were making something special with Casino Royale. They knew they were burning a lot of what had been previously established in the series to the ground and then rebuilding it from the ground floor, different building plans included. And no one pulled their punch. No one cut this movement off at the knees or put up a barrier it couldn't cross. Because of that, Casino Royale turned into a full-on reinvigoration of the James Bond franchise, rather than some micromanaged, neutered attempt at it. For example, spoof film aside, imagine if they had decided to make Casino Royale one of the first films in the 1960s. It makes sense, after all, as the first of the novels, but could we have gotten this film back then? With the ways in which movie studios operated back then, with the negative reaction filmmakers often received if they pushed the envelope so far, could Casino Royale have been made with the same level of freedom that Campbell and Craig had in the mid-2000s? 
Well, we'll never know for sure, but I highly doubt it. Either way, it's a good thing we didn't get Casino Royale in the 60s, because if that were the case, someone other than Martin Campbell would have directed it. And as much as I love Terrence Young, Martin Campbell is on the Mount Rushmore of Bond directors. I cannot overstate how brilliant Campbell has been for James Bond. In the 90s, after a six year hiatus that saw the Cold War come to an end, saw Timothy Dalton get screwed over, saw Pierce Brosnan take over the role in which left the franchise's future uncertain, Campbell came in and dropped Goldeneye, a kick-ass, explosive Bond adventure that was the critical and commercial success the series needed in order to survive. In some ways, perhaps forced by the fact that The Wall no longer existed, GoldenEye was a reinvention of the Bond films, but only to an extent. It still very much follows the Bond formula, sending the spy on a globe-spanning adventure where he spars with post-USSR Russians, encounters a beautiful but talented woman halfway through, hooks up with her, and brings down a villain intent on global financial domination. It's in the finer details, such as making the villain a former colleague of Bond's, and in how Bond's flippin' sexism no longer scores him points with the ladies, but instead gets him called out by them, that Goldeneye branches out into new territory. Overall, it's exactly the Bond film it needed to be in 1995, a largely safe and entertaining entry with exciting action sequences that never get boring, a great sense of villains, and a charismatic and charming new Bond. And 25 years later, we still have a Bond franchise. So, after Die Another Day surfed the franchise into a tsunami of ridiculousness, who did Eon turn to in order to forge a new path and save Bond a second time? Martin Campbell. Except this time, they really went for it. It wasn't enough to just make another GoldenEye and continue on the way they had. This needed to be a film that changed everything. And right from the black and white opening we talked about earlier, it did. No gun barrel at the beginning. <gasps> Instead, we get the coolest opening a Bond film has ever gotten. Right from the first fade in, Campbell builds a mystery. Who is this guy roaming through this office building? Where is that elevator taking him? Oh, is this his office? Why is he going there so late at night? Why is his safe? Oh, oh there's James Bond. Every shot of this first minute is pitch perfect, and then Campbell doesn't let up for another two hours. He has such a phenomenal sense of space and setting, how to move a camera, when not to move it at all. What syllable of Daniel Craig's line to rack focus on for maximum impact. And then the film smash cuts to... a bathroom? Yep. Martin Campbell puts Bond in the toilet. Except no, he doesn't. Bond drowns that other guy in a sink, grabs his gun, guy's not dead after all, and there's the gun barrel. Kind of. It's not a full gun barrel sequence happening in a flash and going into the main credits, kind of like how this isn't a fully formed James Bond yet, right? There isn't really anything to say about this opening that isn't just superlatives. It's an unceasingly ballsy opening to Casino Royale. I'm not saying Campbell wasn't confident making Goldeneye. That movie f***s. But Casino Royale is, by comparison, Campbell walking in the room and saying, right, I'm making my f***ing Bond movie now, and then just going for it. The press and the internet alike might have been thrashing this film before seeing a foot of celluloid, but that's on them. When you have a director and leading man who are both making bold statements for Bond, that's going to motivate the rest of the team too. Phil Mayhew, director of photography on most of Martin Campbell's feature films, including GoldenEye, rejoined Campbell for Casino Royale, and even he went all in on giving Bond a new vision. GoldenEye is a great film to look at, but aesthetically, it's definitely in line with the couple of Bond films that came before it and the couple that came after, and it's arguably in line with 90s cinema in general. Casino Royale, on the other hand, didn't look like anything we'd seen before in Bond, and in a lot of ways, it doesn't look like anything we've gotten since. Black and white is a bold enough choice, but once color enters the film, all bets are off. Right from the blood in the gun barrel, there's a deliberate saturation and richness to the color. Like you're there in the world with Bond, rather than viewing it through some cinematic filter. It almost makes you forget that you're watching a movie so much as a document of Bond's life. Maybe the filmmaking in Casino Royale doesn't call attention to itself from the screen the same way, say, Skyfall and Spectre do, 
but that doesn't make it any less brilliant. Take the scene where Bond stalks Le Chief in the casino, hell-bent on killing him after losing in the poker game with only Felix Leiter to stop him from a foolish move. Campbell creates a palpable urgency to the scene largely by doing very little, by ordering simple camera movements in cohesive cutting that only gets faster as Bond gets closer and closer to the murder he plans to commit. Even though we're only halfway through the film, you really believe Bond will kill the villain at this point and nothing seems capable of stopping him until Jeffrey Wright appears in front of him. The valve through which all of the built up tension can now flow out. If you've got the time, I'd be happy to extend this praise to pretty much every single scene in the film. This isn't just a confident filmmaker putting everything on the table, this is a phenomenally talented director using decades of experience to execute his craft at an exceptionally high level. And this is doubly true of the action sequences. I've spoken before about Tomorrow Never Dies and Moonraker using their action sequences as examples of influential moments in the genre, not only influencing other action films, but even functioning as a well the Bond franchise would return to. Just as with choosing an actor to portray Bond, if something's worked before, why not revisit it down the line? But with Casino Royale, just as we had never seen a James Bond like this on the big screen, there had never been anything in the previous 20 films like the action sequences we get in Casino Royale. That opening fight in the bathroom is one thing, but when the film moves to Madagascar, it unleashes a new frontier for action cinema. Parkour! Internet sensation of 2004 and it was in one of the Bond films. Here's where I stand. The free running sequence in Madagascar is the best action sequence in the entire James Bond series. Hell, it is my personal favorite action sequence in cinema, period. It doesn't let up from the moment Bond's idiot colleague blows their cover. Another testament to the confidence that Campbell and company flexed all over this film and the physical craftsmanship shown by Sebastian Foucan and kept up with by Daniel Craig, combined with the relentless tone of the sequence keeps you on the edge of your seat no matter how many times you watch it. It's like watching ballet. You don't necessarily know when the big technical move is going to come, but you know it when you see it. And you marvel at watching these pros operate at the highest level. And honestly, after the CGI onslaught that was Die Another Day, to say that Casino Royale has its fair share of CG, it's hard to tell. Most of what's being done here is practical, and whatever isn't blends in beautifully. Every beat works to showcase Bond's character, too. He's a blunt instrument, not an endlessly nimble gymnast. Fukan rockets up steel beams. Bond uses an excavator as a ramp. Fukan vaults over a fence. Bond uses a bulldozer to smash through it. Fukan throws his gun at Bond to throw off his balance. Bond just calmly catches it. Fukan vaults himself through a narrow opening at the top of a wall. Bond literally smashes through said wall. Bond is a ruthless killing machine, and while his job was to learn what Fukan's bomb maker was up to, at the end of the day, he's not going to just let him get asylum and escape to safety. Bond proceeding to wreak havoc on an embassy might have been a questionable decision, but if you watch through the entire sequence, including the explosion Bond causes at the end, the only person he kills is his target. And while it certainly helps the film to cite its action sequences as being revolutionary, fantastic, and in service of Bond as a character, do they also service the story? Well, yeah, of course. But what is that story? Well, let's look at Ian Fleming's original novel. A lot of Bond films use titles from the books, and most of those at least loosely adapt to the overall story, too. But only a small handful are truly faithful adaptations. Casino Royale is probably only second to Honor Majesty's Secret Service as far as how closely it was adapted to the screen from the source material. Remember that brilliant pre-title sequence I've been gushing about this entire time? Well, the first chapter of the novel describes how Bond earned his 00 status as well, and it's through the same method, two sanctioned kills. Granted, killing a Japanese spy in the Rockefeller Center isn't quite the same as a brutal fight in the bathroom, but Bond's other kill in the novel, killing a Norwegian double agent who has sold out two British agents, directly mirrors his confrontation with Dryden. 
This carries over into the first half of the film, where Bond learns both the positives and negatives of doing things his way. After all, he is scolded by M after his incident at the embassy, and again about his recklessness in how he foils a plot to destroy an airliner which gets an innocent woman killed. He doesn't just automatically have everything together, and he also doesn't escape consequences for his mistakes. It's Bond learning how to actually be 007, which again, is the only way Casino Royale could have worked. If he had just already been fully formed, it would have just been another Bond movie, and I can't help to stress this again, but what would be the point then? Although it works in service of this origin story, the film nonetheless spends that first act largely going off in another direction from the novel. And yet, I think, oddly enough, that this also speaks to how excellent of an adaptation Casino Royale is. We get Bond investigating a plot in the Bahamas and Miami that wasn't in the novel at all, as well as two absolutely killer action set pieces, Madagascar and the carnage at the Miami International Airport, that were also new creations for the film. In the process, however, Le Chief, the main villain, is thwarted by Bond's actions in the first act, forcing him to make a desperate gamble on the central poker game. In the novel, on the other hand, Le Chief enters the Baccarat game because he lost all of his money investing in French brothels. That's all well and good, but I think the film actually has a leg up on the book because Bond indirectly causes Le Chief's misfortune. It creates a tension between the two characters before they even meet. By having Le Chief try to short the airline stocks instead, a bet that falls apart when his terrorist plot collapses, it both creates a villain who ups the ante considerably and updates the story to the post 9-11 world that Casino Royale found itself in. The events of 2001 were still hanging over the world five years later, and Le Chief's initial plan to profit off of terrorism was both a way to address it, but also present a unique take on what terrorism looks like. Wealthy investors creating chaos, versus the trend of, well, it's always just Islamic extremism, isn't it? That cinema had kind of fallen into for those first few years after the attacks. Another thing to keep in mind is that the novel really isn't an origin story, it just happens to be the first of the novels. It's not trying to go back and examine the foundation of who James Bond is, the story just had to start somewhere. The film, on the other hand, has to recontextualize a character after he had been a cinematic icon for more than 40 years. That makes it so much more difficult to tell the beginning of his story, because that psychological link that the audience makes, where they attach a personality trait and set of tropes to Bond because of what came before, is inherently so difficult to erase. Even while the film was being made, I can't help but wonder if this is a difficulty the crew were aware of, and whether or not they thought they could overcome it. Luckily for Casino Royale, Batman Begins was kind of the first one through the wall in this regard. That film was also taking a long-running literary and cinematic character and rebooting him after decades. Christopher Nolan's goal with Batman Begins was to rediscover the humanity in Batman by bringing him back to his beginning and exploring where he came from. Now, repeat that sentence, but put Martin Campbell and Casino Royale and James Bond in their respective spots. Sound familiar? Hell, the circumstances each cinematic franchise was in at the time was even similar, with Batman and Robin having arguably destroyed the Batman movies in a lot of fans' minds the way Die Another Day had for Bond fans. Batman and Robin had tried to do Adam West and went way too far, whereas Die Another Day tried to go in a Roger Moore, Moonraker kind of direction and just fell flat on its face. When Batman begins release to both critical adoration and box office dominance, Eon must have gained even more confidence in what they were doing. They had to be on the right track with this movie, and boy, they were. Batman Begins succeeded because it recognized that Batman and Robin was not only unmoored from its franchise's vision, but in fact was guided by the very lack of a vision at all. Casino Royale recognized the same problem in Die Another Day and actively worked to fix it. Casino Royale is ultimately a film that distills James Bond's humanity and personality and focuses on examining that rather than just being a hodgepodge of what came before it. It paves entirely new ground effortlessly because it wasn't really even trying to. 
Everyone involved with making Casino Royale set out to do one specific thing, ask and answer one question. Who is James Bond? The film accomplished this so well that when it does insert a piece of Bond's mythology, you don't think of it as fan service because it's centered on and in service of Daniel Craig's portrayal and a script that rebuilds Bond from the ground up. Honestly, Austin Powers might even be to thank for some of this. Before that parody dropped, Eon were just making Bond films. It was only after their method had been lampooned so successfully that Eon realized they needed to change tactics and actually make films about who James Bond is. When we talked about Moonraker last time, I talked about how the production of the Bond films has always rode the waters of the cinematic landscape. Well, in the early to mid-2000s, the cinematic landscape was focused on fully fleshed human beings. The most popular characters such as Batman and Jason Bourne were being featured in stories built around them rather than just serving as the person at the center of a story. Post 9-11 audiences wanted something more human and real that could still give them escapism, and Casino Royale adapts to those sensibilities beautifully. It's in many ways the pinnacle of post 9-11 filmmaking, yet it still remains true to its source material that was written more than half a century earlier. Similarly, the updated version of Le Chiffre that we get in the film, like how the extended first act adds entirely new material, makes radical changes to the way the villain is portrayed, yet it still keeps one foot firmly in Fleming's original work. In the novel, Le Chiffre is this gluttonous, short, disgusting pig of a man, the physical opposite of Bond in just about every imaginable way. In the film, on the other hand, he's portrayed by Mads <laughs> Mikkelsen, who is an unendingly handsome man regardless of how many facial scars and bleeding tear ducts you give him. He's tall, he's charming, even in a room with other bad guys he lights the place up, and yet, despite being nothing like the book character physically, the film still captures the character's atmosphere, his casting and costuming true to the page even without being a one-to-one -one translation. By physically being more of a mirror to Bond, this opens the door for Le Chiffre to also be a mirror to Bond in his personality and actions. The best Bond villains, Red Grant, Alec Trevelyan, Fran Sanchez, tend to have some kind of similar trait or behavior to that of Bond, which is warped into something evil. The greatest way to make a compelling antagonist for James Bond is to make them an antithesis of the man, to present us with someone that Bond is capable of being had he not become a secret agent. After all, Bond is every bit as brilliant a poker player as Le Chiffre is. They're likely in the same bracket as far as their intelligence goes. In a different world, could Bond have been Le Chiffre or Le Chiffre Bond? Maybe. This is something that doesn't really exist in the novel. The film dares to look deeper to examine Le Chiffre as a human being, just as it examines Bond. It isn't just for the hell of it that we repeatedly cut away to Le Chiffre before he and Bond ever meet. Casino Royale shows us who this man is to a deeper extent than arguably any other villain in the series. We as an audience come to know him, and that reinforces the idea that Bond has him figured out too. And so when Bond falls for Le Chiffre's fake tell, something so obvious as weeping blood, we feel like we've fallen for it too. Le Chiffre exploits Bond's cockiness in this moment, with Bond not having thought of how Le Chiffre would be monitoring him in return. But Bond gets back at the villain. By the time Le Chiffre has Bond bound to a chair, torturing him, desperate to save himself with the money from the poker game, his only opportunity is his mirror. And just as Le Chiffre couldn't help himself from gambling with his collaborator's money, couldn't see the path he was headed down, he becomes so certain that he can dig himself out of his hole that he doesn't realize Bond will never give up the information he needs until it's too late. There's a moment in the Bond documentary, Everything or Nothing, a discussion around Ian Fleming's belief that third-party organizations would be the ones behind terrorism and chaos, scapegoating global powers and ideologies in order to cause the destruction of the latter, all for their own gain. Like I said before, cinema was deeply invested in the aftermath of 9-11, in the belief that Islam in general, not just extremists, was the world's greatest evil. They were scapegoated and ostracized for no reason other than their skin color and their faith. 
and the entertainment industry specifically perpetuated that narrative. It took years for cinema to gain a more measured perspective, but Casino Royale got it right back in 2006. Le Chiffre is the unknowable threat, the hidden figure bankrolling terrorist attacks. He works for a shadow organization with their fingerprints all over evil stuff worldwide, but who have pawns they can manipulate to bear the public brunt of their actions. After all, who would the news focus on? The suicide bomber who destroyed a newly unveiled airliner? or the person who funded the attack but covered up the paper trail. In a roundabout way, Casino Royale managed to make the long-defunct Spectre relevant again and ultimately planted the seeds for the organization to return in the film of the same name. It's also crazy to think that this film came out before the financial crisis, with Lashif shorting stocks and attempting to destabilize the market, being cavalier with hundreds of millions of dollars. It's as if Martin Campbell and Eon knew something three years before disaster struck. But what's even more remarkable is how Le Chiffre's actions here are framed in the context of the film. The scenes where he places shorts with his broker feel a lot like he's in a casino interacting with a dealer, placing bets. Because after all, playing the markets is gambling, a rose by any other name only in that it isn't literally regulated by the gambling commission. It sets up Le Chiffre's behavior as a poker player, it sets up the second act of the film, and it sets up Le Chiffre's ultimate downfall and demise. As with the rest of Casino Royale, nothing is extraneous. Everything is in conversation with everything else in the story, and if you're going to take a shot at creating one of the best Bond villains ever, that is an essential part of the process. So the filmmakers accomplished rebooting Bond, and the villain is one of the best. All of that is well and good, but I told you earlier that Casino Royale is one of the greatest films ever made. I even specified that it is one of the most moving films ever made. I can already hear the protest. It takes more than technical brilliance in successfully adapting a popular book for a film to be moving. I get it. So let's examine what Casino Royale is really about. Heart. Central to this film is James Bond's relationship with Vesper Lynn. For the first act of Casino Royale, we see a raw and unrefined Bond who stops at nothing to accomplish his mission. Once he's done that, he's off to Montenegro to foil a sheaf a second time. Here, we get to see him more refined, wearing a suit for the first time in the film, enjoying a fancy meal on a train, and encountering the character through which we as an audience get to have a POV of James Bond for the next two acts. After all, in order for us to get into Bond and feel like we're experiencing him for the first time, Bond himself needs someone in his story to experience him for the first time, to clash with him, to get inside his head. Vesper does that right from their first scene together. Bond is pretty gracious about the way Vesper dissects him, and he deserves it, trying to pick apart her entire life like that, even cracking a quip afterwards. How was your lamb? Skewered. From that moment onwards, the film is constructed not around the poker game or taking down Le Chief, but around Bond's relationship with Vesper Lind. It's the entire dramatic backbone of both the novel and the film, and I'd even argue it's stronger in the movie. Look, I was 11 years old when Casino Royale hit theaters. I was too young to really understand the Bond tropes, what makes a Bond woman a Bond woman, and so on but I could articulate that Vesper didn't feel like a Bond woman to me. She felt like a fully formed co-lead in this movie because she is a fully formed co-lead. That ties further into how Casino Royale is a deconstruction of Bond. Sure, she is a Bond woman, but she fills the role of being a fully formed character first and the role of being a Bond woman second. Vesper wasn't designed to fill a role or a set of tropes, she's just organically a part of the story, like Felix Leiter or Renee Mathis. None of these characters are there just to be there. Felix isn't just there for the sake of the odd Felix scene, which is certainly something the character is guilty of in the past Bond films. Felix does something very specific in this film that saves Bond from making a stupid decision and then proceeds to get Bond back in the game. Every character has a reason to exist in this story. Every character has at least one moment where their presence is essential. 
Mathis serves as both a red herring to Vesper's betrayal, but also in its aftermath, a lesson to Bond that you can't just automatically, unconditionally assume someone's betrayal. Vesper, meanwhile, teaches Bond the opposite. You can't just blindly trust someone and never question their loyalty. But I'm getting ahead of myself anyway, because Vesper functions as so much more than that throughout the film. She's there to reveal and dissect the dimensions of Bond one by one. Vesper builds a proper connection to Bond, making him more vulnerable, stripping his armor from him until he has none left. Hell, she's even the first person in the series to directly confront him about the fact that he has and will kill people. It doesn't bother you killing those people? Vesper asks. Well, I wouldn't be very good at my job if it did. Bond replies. Confidently, but also with a certain tone that implies he has just accepted that he must be this way because it's all he has known. Throughout his cinematic history, Bond has always had a reputation as a womanizer. When Bond connects with and then sleeps with Solange earlier in the movie, especially considering the way he walks out on Solange once he has the information he needs, it plays on a preconceived notion of who Bond is and how he treats women. But then he meets Vesper. And while Bond's interactions with her don't change the fact that he is and can be a player, it doesn't mean he can't shut that part of himself off in order to form something more emotional and real with one person. It doesn't mean he's disconnected from his feelings or that he can't develop a long-term attachment. Bond might not admit it to himself until late in the film, but he yearns for something more, to the point where he would give up the adulterous behavior he enjoys in order to have it. Once again, Casino Royale insists that you leave what you think you know about James Bond at the door, because whether or not you do, it's going to either reintroduce them to you in a different way, or prove them wrong entirely. It's exceptionally refined and mature storytelling that you can't find elsewhere in the series, except for maybe Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And even then, Casino Royale further refines it and goes even deeper. Bond invests himself in Vesper, and because as an audience we are experiencing his actions through Vesper, it makes her betrayal so much more heartbreaking. Bond and Vesper's relationship is the central focus of the story. The competition it brings to the two halves of who Bond is, and it's right after he chooses which side to be on, that everything blows up in his face. When Bond recedes into being adulterous in Quantum of Solace and beyond, we can judge him if we want to, but Casino Royale at least makes it so we can simultaneously understand him. It's not that his behavior is justified, it's that we pity him. What happened between Bond and Vesper ruined Bond. It's not fair, as life so often proves to be, and it's profoundly sad. As with Daniel Craig's interpretation of the role, Bond's experience with Vesper is something that informs the rest of his tenure. It's impossible in almost any moment, but particularly those where Bond interacts with another woman, to not see the ghost of Vesper hanging over his decisions. Most notably, when Bond runs off with Madeline Swan at the end of Spectre, it's because he's felt a sliver of what Vesper gave him, something which he lost and thought he could never have back, and so he seizes upon it because... Once you've tasted it, that's all you want to drink. <laughs> There's a clear arc that begins on the train to Montenegro in Casino Royale, and ends in the DB5 as it leaves London in Spectre, and will continue on into No Time to Die. And honestly, if Daniel Craig's performance as Bond is something that deserved attention from the Oscars, then Eva Green is right there beside him. The way these two complement one another is some of the most engaging interplay that any screen couple has ever had. There's never a moment where Green doesn't match Craig, whether it be effortlessly countering one of his one-liners, ruthlessly swatting away one of his points when they argue, nonchalantly teaching him the difference between dinner jackets and dinner jackets, or meeting one of his emotional revelations with one of her own, delivering lines that will warm your heart the first time you see her speak them and devastate you on every subsequent rewatch. Among all the great iconic cinematic romances, particularly the tragic ones, it's mind-boggling how this one isn't a constant part of the conversation. As great as Tracy is in Majesties, as emotional and tragic as that romance is, Casino Royale takes the ideas and spirit behind that relationship to a whole different level. 
It has left a monumental feeling over the character in the rest of Craig's tenure, a wistful what could have been that rears its ugly head every now and then far more potently than when the older films would occasionally name drop or hint at Tracy. Casino Royale overall strengthens our attachment to James Bond, and in turn, that is owed to Vesper Lind. After Bond loses Vesper, his entire perception of humanity upended and his world left in tatters, he turns to his only remaining resource, MI6. Having resigned from the service to build a life with Vesper, now that she is gone after betraying him and forcing him back down a path of violence, what option does Bond have but to stay the course and continue to bring down evil for his government? Bond has a candid conversation with M, who compassionately offers Bond more time before he comes back. It's an almost paternal moment between the two, something which had rarely been seen in the films, but is a fairly standard dynamic between the two characters in Ian Fleming's books. M might be a man in the works of Ian Fleming, but he nevertheless functions as something of a father figure for the complicated and often damaged agent. Judy Dench had, of course, played M during all of Brosnan's tenure, but she was playing a very different character in those films. There, M and Bond were something of equals. Yes, she lays down the law and puts her foot down, she even calls Bond a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. But on a purely professional level, there's a mutual respect and level playing field between the two, even if she is his boss. In Casino Royale, on the other hand, and later through Quantum of Solace and Skyfall, M initiates and then carries on this almost motherly role towards Bond. In the first scene she ever shares with Craig's Bond, she's furious at him, unleashing a tirade of anger that we never saw from her with Brosnan. She scolds him for acting like an idiot, like a mother would scold her son for being expelled from school. But this isn't just mere contempt. M goes on to demand better of Bond, seeing the potential in him. Rather than fire him, she asks that he use his head and get the answers they need rather than just shooting his way out of every situation. It's almost like the motivational speech a parent gives their son in a million cliched films, say before the big game or before graduation. Except here, it doesn't win Bond the day, it just diverts him onto a better course. And like a parent, she always has a last chance to give Bond, scolding him once again, though not as harshly, in Nassau about allowing him to enter the poker game at Casino Royale, albeit with a tracking device. Once again, Bond is off the hook, except that this time he has had a privilege taken away, his ability to hide from M. Casino Royale so strongly establishes this character dynamic that Quantum of Solace goes on to joke about, and it becomes as much of a focus in Skyfall as Bond and Vesper's relationship was in this film. That three film progression is akin to a child who bickered with their mother, coming to understand and respect them as an adult. You don't get a satisfying execution of that arc unless you nail it from the beginning. This is the final piece of the puzzle for Bond's origin story his mentor figure. It doesn't matter who your character is, if you wish to tell the beginning of their story, there has to be someone who shapes them at the start of their journey. It's true of Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's true of Spider-Man and Uncle Ben, it's even true in Batman Begins of Batman and Ra's al Ghul, and it was true of the M in Ian Fleming's novels, so why shouldn't it be true of the M on screen? The most brilliant thing is that Martin Campbell was setting up this relationship and we didn't even realize it was set up. Because of the work done with M in Casino Royale, it allowed the subsequent films in Craig's tenure to tell a variety of stories. So just keep in mind that if M's death in Skyfall affected you emotionally, you owe a lot of that success to Casino Royale. It's funny too, because often when a film tries to set something up this way, it shoehorns it in, resulting in one reaction from the audience. Groans and eye rolls. There are more than a handful of MCU films that hammer you over the head, looking forward to other movies, detracting from the story that film tries to tell. The worst example of this is when a film is split into a part one and part two, and the ending of part one is just the end of a random scene. You're flat out ending your movie halfway through and expecting people to wait a year or two for the other half. 
Casino Royale doesn't do any of that. It points to the future of Bond, and no one even realized it at the time. Casino Royale's screenplay juggling all of these elements at once was the third from the duo of Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who joined the series with The World Is Not Enough. That first film tried to do something really interesting with Bond, putting him up against a main villain who was also one of the Bond women, and only revealing her as a villain long after the two had consummated a relationship. I suppose you could argue that Casino Royale takes a similar trajectory with Vesper, but I also don't think Vesper's really a villain. She's more someone forced into an impossible situation, whereas Electric King, while twisted by something awful happening to her, also chose a vindictive path to follow, where she murdered her own father and nearly destroyed Istanbul. Either way, it is kind of interesting how The World Is Not Enough mirrors Casino Royale on a superficial level like that, and also how Purvis and Wade would return to that well again for Skyfall. However, The World Is Not Enough tends to wear these character beats in its dialogue, with Bond and Elektra both vocally spelling out their emotional states. You can tell it's the writer duo's first time within the franchise, with an inclination to explain everything, to have literal tells in the script, for example, in the form of Renard repeating words spoken by Electra. In Casino Royale, it more closely follows the adage of show, don't tell, and honestly, if I can nitpick anything being spoon-fed to the audience, it's just Mathis telling us how much money is in the pot during the poker game. I don't doubt that these improvements came naturally as the result of Purvis and Wade's advancements as writers, but I think it also helps that a third writer was allowed to join the duo, the brilliant Paul Haggis. Even on his worst day, Haggis respects the intelligence and attention span of his audience. He went on to write the first draft of Quantum of Solace, and even under the threat of a looming writer's strike, his talents enabled him to create a nuanced story that trusts its reader, and had it been adapted to the screen with no edits, its audience to follow along. By combining Haggis' gifts with Purvis and Wade's experience with the franchise, we get a screenplay that is far more refined than the previous two efforts. Purvis and Wade have learned how to tell a story visually rather than through dialogue, and Haggis, already having learned that skill, amplifies this progress. At the end of the day, it's smart storytelling on a level that just did not exist in Bond for the previous two films, and arguably even surpasses the likes of Majesties in that regard. What's even more of a benefit to Casino Royale, however, is how the three writers made this introspective and spoon-feeding free screenplay, but didn't make it ponderous or dull at any point. I mean, come on, this thing has poker in it. That takes up like 30 pages. I get people watch professional poker, but I like to refer to Texas Hold'em as NyQuil. Your average person just does not give a shit about poker. But they sure do if they watch Casino Royale. I've seen this movie a billion times, and yet I still haven't been able to decipher the magic behind how the poker game scenes are as compelling and engaging as they are. Maybe it's the charisma of the people around the table, maybe it's because a fight scene and the poisoning scene break the game into three parts, but even without that, this game moves in a dynamic and exciting way that even the most high-octane real-life events can't manage. And honestly, I credit the screenplay for that first. I've heard poker snobs say the movie takes liberties with this and that and blah blah blah. You know, who cares? I'd rather get the final hand showdown we got, a serious nail biter as we don't know what Bond has in his hand while the other players reveal theirs, than a realistic showdown where Bond and Le Chief show their cards right away and all of the tension never even gets a chance to start building up. The liberties in the script made that possible, and Martin Campbell brought it home in execution. In the process, the movie still makes it perfectly clear what's happening at every point in the game, even for people who know nothing about poker. And with how efficiently the screenplay achieves that, it then allows the audience to focus on what really matters, that this game is a showdown between Bond and Le Chief. In the novel, it was Baccarat. In the film, it's Texas Hold'em. In theory, they could have been playing any game. The real game is a psychological game of chicken. Will you yield in time? And the poker game just operates as a venue through which hero and villain charge at one another. 
I think it's worth mentioning that Le Chiffre is the only villain in the entire series that Bond never has a direct fight against. I mean, there's the torture scene, but I view that more as Le Chiffre putting Bond through a trial. Other than the moment where Bond grabs a knife and makes a move on Le Chiffre, which Felix thwarts, he never throws a punch or fires a gun in Le Chiffre's direction. Theirs is an entirely mental battle, and it's endlessly fascinating. Because after all, the climax of the film isn't Bond's confrontation with Le Chiffre, it's what happens after the mission has ended and Bond has called it a day. In fact, that's what I love most about Bond falling for Le Chiffre's fake tell. Vesper has tells of her own. Hesitations and stumbles and evasions that give away her duplicity. But Bond is so convinced that the game is over that he isn't even looking for them anymore. When that third act of Casino Royale hits, it really is just sublime. We get to see Bond domesticated. We get to see him finally have a fully formed relationship. We see him resign his 00 status. We see Bond happy. In 21 films, we never got to see what happens to Bond after the mission is over. Beyond most times, him hooking up with the Bond woman five minutes after he's either killed the villain or taken out the last henchman. We've never truly gotten the portrayal of the days, weeks, months after James Bond has done his duty, and we've certainly never gotten to see him on an extended period of leave with one woman by his side. Purvis, Wade, and Haggis gave us all of that with Casino Royale, let us bask in it for 20 minutes, and then ripped it away, not only from Bond, but from the audience as well. Vesper betrays Bond, stealing the winnings from the poker game and attempting to give them away to Le Chiffre's higher-ups. And Bond, despite his heartbreak and anger towards Vesper, when he has taken out all the other bad guys and it's just the two of them, tries to save her. They're either in some hotel or apartment building in Venice, a place under construction, but where people could perhaps one day live together. Bond and Vesper were a thing under construction as well, proceeding towards a life where they could cohabitate, but in this moment, both the building and their life together are sinking into the canals of Venice. And rather than salvage what is left and live her life looking over her shoulder, fearing not only for herself, but for the man she loves, Vesper chooses to die. It is, bar none, the most heartbreaking moment out of all of these films, an emotional climax wholly earned by the two hours preceding it. It is the capstone on a magnificent screenplay, and Martin Campbell brings it to life just as expertly as he did with the rest of this magnificent movie we call Casino Royale. There are dinner jackets, and there are dinner jackets, and there are movies, and there are movies. Just like the first tuxedo that James Bond ever steps into, Casino Royale is the latter. Casino Royale has been a mainstay of my top five favorite films for years, and every time I revisit it, it does so much more than just stay fresh. I discover something new about it, I fall just a little bit more in love with it. It's incredible that this is a two hour and 20 minute film because it does not feel like it. Everyone is firing on all cylinders, working in top form here, from Martin Campbell to Daniel Craig to Eva Green to Purvis, Wade, Haggis, David Arnold. I got through all of this without even getting to mention David Arnold's score, how lush and brilliant it is, how it is always underscoring Bond's characterization at any given point in the movie, how You Know My Name is the greatest Bond theme of all time, and how David Arnold beautifully weaves it in and out of the rest of the film's soundtrack. The fact that we don't get the Bond theme until the very end of the film because James Bond isn't James Bond yet. It's such a simple, obvious decision, and yet its impact when you watch the film is monumental. I didn't get a chance to talk about how the filmmakers accidentally set a world record for the most flips made by a car during a stunt. I talked about the torture scene, but I didn't get to dive deep into how Daniel Craig and Mads Mikkelsen are fucking peaking as performers opposite one another in that dark room. All of those parts of this film deserve to be gushed about to no end, and they're the things I had to rattle off at the end because Casino Royale is a masterpiece. It is impossible to do this cinematic triumph justice in only one hour, but here I am, trying anyways, because Casino Royale deserves it. It is so much more than a James Bond film. 
It's a film about finding yourself as a human being, about regret for past sins, about charging forward. It's a film about love and about betrayal and about what it feels like to lose a love that you thought would always be in your life. It's about fighting to the last to save what you have, even if what you're trying to save rejects your help. They put all of this in a James Bond movie. Martin Campbell and everyone else involved went for this and succeeded. It's one of those films that you know is exceptional, and yet you so often find yourself at a loss for words when you try to explain why it is exceptional. Because it is exceptional against all odds. The tabloids didn't want this movie, a sizable contingent of the fans didn't want this movie. There were actors and directors and even talent involved with previous Bond movies that thought Casino Royale was going to fail. That Daniel Craig was going to fail. But here we are, 15 years later. And not only did Casino Royale prove its preemptive haters wrong, it went above and beyond the call of duty and exceeded its supporters expectations. Again. I was only 11 when this movie came out and changed everything, but you can find any number of remarks from people who were there, who had been longtime Bond fans, and who were coming to the series for the first time, and they will tell you for themselves that Casino Royale absolutely blew them away. I might not have seen Casino Royale in a theater back in 2006, but thank God for that stupid Netflix DVD. I fell in love with the film. I fell in love with Daniel Craig's performance as Bond, and both have only gotten better with age. To all the haters back in 2006, and to whichever ones might remain today, if I haven't been able to sway you over the past hour, then I'll leave you with the words of Daniel Craig himself. The name's Bond. James Bond. James <laughs> Bond.